It's always a great honor and particularly a pleasure to come to this Beis HaKnesses. Firstly, this is the only shtender that is actually my height. <laughs> I've been in many shuls. They make them too short. But because of the great stature of Yerav in all dimensions, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here. I was recently perusing Yerav Sefer, which maybe I'll reference a little bit further on in the talk. Many people before my time remember where they were when JFK was assassinated. Certainly all of us remember where we were on 9-11. And I think when it comes to October 7th, it will forever be a day etched in our consciousness. Turns out October 7th is and will be a turning point in world history. Who would have expected it? Who would have known? Who could have predicted such a thing? But I want to take you back now, 10 years before October 7th, not to Rosh Hashanah Tavshin Pei He, to Rosh Hashanah Tavshin Ayin He. Do you remember what happened 10 years ago on Rosh Hashanah Tavshin Ayin He? Rosh Hashanah Tavshin Ayin He had the potential, Chas V'Shalom, to be the most tragic, catastrophic day in recent Jewish history. Do you remember what happened? Nothing happened. But it was reported a few months earlier on July 29, 2014, when they, for the first time, captured a few Hamas terrorists and they interrogated them and they found out shocking, horrifying information. One of the soldiers asked the terrorists, now these interrogations, these are serious interrogations. You know, somebody from the Shin Bet revealed, whether, whether it was today or the day before, that he spent 180 hours with Sinwar. Halavai, you should spend that amount of time with your Chavrusa. He interrogated Sinwar for 180 hours. So they interrogated these terrorists and they came, they stumbled across an entire labyrinth and network of tunnels that were built 25 feet into the ground. Tunnels that went from Gaza all the way to Beersheba. And they said, you know, on Shuldik Mir, Mr. Terrorist, why haven't you used these tunnels yet? And do you remember what the terrorists answered? We were building these tunnels for 12 years. And we were waiting for the right moment. We were trained. We were primed. And the date that we picked was Rosh Hashanah, 2014, Tavshin Ayin Hay. Why Rosh Hashanah? Because it's the only time the soldiers are really off. It's the only two-day holiday in Israel. All of Hamas would then go through this labyrinth of tunnels. You'd have a few dozen terrorists in each tunnel. Each terrorist would grab a few dozen Israeli citizens until the entire... Uh, population of Israel would be hostage in the tunnels. The army would not be able to bomb the tunnels. And that would put an end to the Zionist regime. Remember, this is what happened 10 years ago. And it was scheduled for Rosh Hashanah, Tavshin Ayin He. We were waiting 12 years. We were planning this. It was going to happen in two months. And because those three boys were kidnapped, and the, the army went into Gaza, and they uncovered the tunnels, and they killed some of the terrorists. That plan never came to fruition. And of course, they knew for sure that once they cherry-picked a few terrorists, nothing would ever happen again. This is open news 10 years ago. And one thing that I can't shake my mind from, the tunnels. Like the tunnels really capture your imagination, this labyrinth of tunnels. Here it is. Israel has no problem cherry-picking leaders of regimes in Iran, in Lebanon. You know, <laughs> they could set off pagers, cell phones, anywhere. They see the speck of dust on the left lapel of your jacket but they still have no idea where Sinwar is hidden in these tunnels. You know, how do you make sense of that? 
What are, the, what are these labyrinth of tunnels coming out of Gaza? Where are they headed? How deep are they? What's going on inside them? Are there tunnels in Lebanon? They found other tunnels in Lebanon. These tunnels were very captivating to me. Like, what's the message of these tunnels? Why is our nemesis hidden in these tunnels? As if there's something that the Rebbe Hashem is telling us, jogging our minds, and who are we to probe the mysteries of world events? But, you know, sometimes you can't help but think, you know, maybe there is some type of message over here. And the first thing that struck me was a story that I read a few years ago, something that happened 74 years ago. 74 years ago on Erev Yom Kippur, during the Holocaust, the Nazis Shema marched into Poland. They took over the city of Warsaw and by the proclamation of the health department of Germany, they closed down all the mikvahs in Warsaw by declaration of the Minister of Health because the Nazis were worried about the health of Jewish women. So they closed down every last mikvah in Warsaw. And in, in the succeeding days you could see in the little shtetlach outside of Warsaw, as Shkia was coming, you could see ladies were starting to walk outside of the city by themselves, headed to the villages on the outskirts of Warsaw, headed to the mikvahs. And sometimes you could see hundreds and sometimes thousands of women would leave the city of Warsaw on the cover of the night to go to the mikvahs outside of Warsaw. And then a year later, the Nazis closed all the mikvahs in Poland. And it's Erev Yom Kippur. And men want to go to the mikvah. So what do they do? Many men jumped into the river and scores of men drowned in the river on Erev Yom Kippur. And then in 1942, the Nazis were standing there on, at the river ready to shoot. So what did they do? You would go into a building, a bombed out building, and you would climb down to the basement. And then in the basement there was a fake door and you would open the fake door and there was a tunnel. And from building A, you would cr crawl on your knees to building B in the pitch black without candle, without flashlight. You'd get down on your hands and knees and climb in the mud. And there were Nazis on motorcycles with sidecars ready to shoot anyone on sight. And we have an eyewitness report that somebody went down into the building and he opened up the trap door and he crawled through the tunnel. And without the aid of a flashlight or a candle, he crawled through the tunnel and he went to the mikvah. And he wasn't the only one. 3,000 men crawled through the tunnel to go to the mikvah on Erev Yom Kippur, seeking taharas haguf. So we Jews, we use tunnels for other things. We also have tunnels. But in our history, we've used tunnels for other things. And then I remembered a memoir that my grandmother wrote. My grandmother published her story of survival in the Holocaust in a book called Flares of Memory. And she wrote a little vignette called The Unsung Heroes of the Warsaw Ghetto. She writes, my grandmother, Aleha Shalom, her yard site was on Gimel Tishrei. She was the last, she was the daughter of the last Rav of the city of Sachachav. She wrote, who are the unsung heroes of the Warsaw Ghetto? Fifty years later, it is still part of me what the children did. These unsung heroes, ages seven, eight, nine, up to twelve. I was one of them. My parents would not let me go into Warsaw proper. They thought they could still protect me but I look, because I looked too Jewish. My grandmother had a sister who was blonde and blue-eyed, so her parents weren't as worried about her. They let her go out, but she was caught, and they never saw her again. But I was allowed to climb through the mazes of tunnels and sewers into the narrow passages of cobwebs, rats, and flo floating raw sewage. 
There could have been informers there, or police, or Gestapo disguised, but Hashem was always with me. Why would I climb through these tunnels? I would bring life-sustaining food, medicine, water to my siblings and parents by crawling through the tunnels of Warsaw. So we Jews, we use tunnels for other things. We use tunnels to go to the mikvah. We use tunnels to bring food for our family. They use tunnels lamisa. We use tunnels l'chaim. But then something struck me. You know, the Chassam Sofer has a principle. The principle is that every force in this world has a counterforce. Every negativity has a pa positive counterforce. Even in the world of war. You know, Chazal say, Talmidei Chachomim Marbim Shalom Ba'olam. Torah scholars bring peace to the world. Ask the Chassam Soifer, how do Torah scholars bring peace to the world? Says the Chassam Soifer, there are different kinds of wars. Every year on Rosh Hashanah, God decrees there should be a quota of war. But when you come to the Beis HaMedrash, and you learn a Toysus, and you fight it out with your Chavrusa, B'molchamta Shal Torah, you don't just sit there, you know, hey, it says over here this, A, B, C. You challenge it, you ask, you fight. That's a melchama. That obviates the need for physical warfare. Mevi shalom la'olam. Talmidei chachamim marbim shalom ba'olam. By engaging in melchamta shel Torah, they minimize the need for as actual physical warfare. You know there's another kind of tunnel? I saw in the Sefer of David Koyin, the Rashiva of Hebron, he, he wrote a Sefer called A Commentary on Maimer HaChachma. The Ramchal wrote a perush on the Tefilah of Yom Naram called Maimer HaChachma. There's a perush on it from Rav David Koyin. There he quotes the Pelayoyetz, who cites the Rashash, Rav Sholem Sharabi, the great Mekobal. And Rav Sholem Sharabi is talking about the power of the Shoifar. And Rav Sholem Sharabi says, Iker tikkun ha shoifar, taloi b'tshuva. The main power of the shoifar is dependent on, sh on shuva. In other words, it's not a note. You blow an inspiring note, and then somehow something magical happens. No, the shoifar works in conjunction with tshuva. Ein koil ha shoifar poyel lamala imloi sha'oila ha koil behisoyrus tshuva. The sound of the shoifar has no effect unless it's combined with tshuva. But says of Shom Sharabi, the good news is, his oirus tshuva b'yoyim zeh, a little bit of tshuva on this day, who keneged toirach gadol b'zman acher, is the equivalency of a lot of tshuva any other time. And this goes for the whole Aser made tshuva. A little bit of tshuva now is as great as a lot of tshuva later. Now's the time. Now's the opportunity. You know, it's going to be hard now. That's just how it is. I don't know, I find when Aser Simei Tshuva come, it just, it's a hard time. And things come up, and you're just so busy, and worn out, and tired. Take that as a good sign, how valuable every moment is. Don't be disheartened. Don't be discouraged. That's because one little iota of tshuva, one little particle of tshuva now is the equivalency of tremendous tshuva at a different time. So ask the rashas, the rashash akasha, come on, we have a big peckle of averos. Really? A little bit of tshuva is going to be so effective? How's it going to work? What about the prosecuting angels? What about the mekatrigim? What about the mastinim? What about the midas hadin? Won't it blow the tshuva out of the waters? Don't you have like these, you know, Houthis up there? They're waiting to like blow up the tshuva? They're going to scrutinize the tshuva. They're going to say that's not a real tshuva. Says the rashash, says Rabbi Yitzhak Isaac Chavar, don't worry, the way tshuva works, God creates a special avenue. It's called a tunnel. God digs a special tunnel that in a convoluted, very a labyrinth system of tunnels through which your tshuva will pass through the heavens and bypass all the prosecutors and all the mastinim and all the makatrigim. And the Satan can't enter these tunnels. 
and the Yetzirah can't enter these tunnels, and the Mekachugim, and the Malachim, and the Midas Adin. It's just a direct pathway between you and the Rebbein Shalayim. Did you ever hear this idea that Shuva is a tunnel? I'm sure you've heard this before. And I don't know why it never struck me. That according to this Chassam Sofer, doesn't it kind of have to be that if our enemy has a certain Kayach, we have at least an equal Kayach, Kenegdam. So what exactly is our power? And is Rebun Shem trying to say something to us like, I want something from you? In a way it's empowering, in a way it's very ennobling. That means Rebun Shem is talking to us. He says, Klal so." If I am giving you, the enemy, the power of tunnels, there's something I'm asking you to do. There's something I would like from you. There's something I want from you. Do you remember the Yushalmi? We all know the story. There was a man by the name of Menashe. He served every idol in the book. And they took him, and they put him in a pot, and they lit the pot. And as by report in the Yushalmi and Sanhedrin, he was cooking real good. There was not an Avodazar in the world Menashe did not cry out to. And then in his final moments, he says, You know, licked in cup, the Tata would tell me the Pasuk, Batsar lecha umitsaucha, Ba'acharis hayamim, Vishavta. He says, Rebun Shalom, I know you're not there, but if you are, you want to give me some help over here? Can you imagine a chutzpah? He didn't say, God help me. He said, I don't really think you're there, but just in case you are, give me a hand. And all of a sudden, the angels were like, you know, come on, God. No, 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 no. That, that's not tshuva. He's done. He's finished. They were waiting for him to burn to a crisp. And all of a sudden, the Rebbe Hashem said, he identified something in the heart of Menashe. And then the Rebun Shalom created a tunnel. And the Malachim said, don't accept it, you can't accept this, you can't turn to this, you can't value this. And the Lashon of the Yushalmi is, Hayu Malachi Hashoris Oymrim Rebun Shalom Adam She'avar Avodazara Vehemid Selem Behechal Atta Mekabloi Betshuva Ma'osa HaKadosh Baruch Hu Chosar Loi Chasira Mitachas Kisei HaKavoyed He dug a tunnel under the throne of glory. And Menashe's tshuva was accepted. I never noticed this before, and I have to tell you, I go to shul on Rosh Hashanah. You know the story of the guy who didn't want to go to shul for Yom Kippur? He said, I can't, I do this every year, it's impossible, it's so long, and you can't eat, I can't drink. This year, I just, I, I'm just going to skip it. And his mother says, Sam, you have to go this year. He says, give me one reason why I have to go. He said, Sam, you're the rabbi. <laughs> so I do go to Shul and Rosh Hashanah, and I am present when they say, Hineni he'ani mimas. And I never realized until this year, in that tefillah, we ask Hashem to dig a tunnel under the Kisei HaKaba to accept the tshuva. And I've been in shul before. This was not my first year. But it hit me this year. Why does God have to dig this tunnel to accept our tshuva? Why can't He just accept our tshuva? Did you ever hear God, oh, you're learning? You're learning the daf? Okay, let's, God's going to dig a tunnel to accept your Torah. The Rav is going to dig a tunnel to accept your tefillah, to recognize your chesed. There are no tunnels. There are no tunnels for Torah. There's no tunnels for tefillah. There's no tunnels for chesed. There are no tunnels for any mitzvah. Why do you need a tunnel for tshuva? I think there's another question you could ask. You know the Gemara in Masech Yuma? Amar Rav Levi, Return Israel until Hashem. Did you ever wonder why does tshuva have to reach the kisei hakavod? 
Do Chazal say G'doy la Toira Shemagas Ad Kisei HaKavod? G'doy la Tfila? G'doy la Chesed? What, Shuvah is the most important, greatest mitzvah? What happens to the other? Where, where, where's my Torah right now? It's stuck at the bridge. Why does Tshuva have to reach the Kisei HaKavod? So I want to share with you Alam the Shakasha. So I find that in Elo and, and in uh, Sesame Tshuva, when people hear Lamdas, they breathe a sigh of relief. The rest of the year, they get very nervous. But Lamdas in, in, in Sesame at least it's not Musar, right? <laughs> oh, Lamdas, yeah, I'm here. So it's, it's, a, it's a Shas HaKoshar for... <laughs> now, do you hear that as a Kasha like this? Now, do you hear that as a Kasha? So Bezda, you, have to, you warn a guy, you say, Rabbi Yid, don't take the seeds out of the watermelon, you know, you could be high of uh, skila if you take the seeds out of the watermelon. He said, no, nah, I've been waiting to do this. I'm going to do it, Afal Pekain. And the guy takes the seeds out of the watermelon, he's not a Sephardi, not like Rav Avadiyaz Psaki. And he takes the seeds out of the watermelon, and they're about to, you know, push him off the roof. He says, what are you doing? He said, we're about to kill you. What are you talking about? I just did tshuva. Don't you know? I am better than you. I'm better than the, the Av Bezdin was, was a tzaddik from when he was born. But I'm on a higher level. I did tshuva me'ahavo even. So back off. I'm out of here. I'm going back home. I'm going to go home for supper. And I would like shlishi tomorrow. Does that work? Of course not. Why not? I thought, Ein lecha davar ha'emed b'fnei ha'tshuva. That's the kasha, the nadu yudah. So I want to share with you what I think Reb Tzalek HaKoyin says. And it's a very simple idea. And that is, tshuva cannot really work in what we call the real world. Tshuva can't work. Tshuva doesn't make any sense. Did you ever see tshuva operating? Imagine somebody standing in front of a judge. He's, uh, he's being... Uh, convicted of every felon in the world, every crime in the world. And he says, look, judge, I'm, I'm, I admit it, I did it. And you know what? I really feel bad about it. And I accept upon myself never to do it again. What effect will that have on his sentence? Zero. Tshuva doesn't work for anything in this world. It doesn't make sense that it should work. I'm sure you're familiar. There's Yushalmi. There's an expanded version in the Yaakov Shemaini where Chazal say, that they asked Chachma what should be the fate of somebody who sins and Chachma said the person should be pursued in evil, he should be destroyed. They asked Nevuah what should be the fate of a sinner, Nevuah said Hanefesh HaChoytes Hitamos. They asked God what should be the fate of the Baal Tshuva and what does Rebbe Shalom say? Yasu Tshuva V'yiskap He should do Tshuva and he will be atoned. He should do tshuva and he should be atoned. Meaning, Chachma says tshuva shouldn't work. Nevua says tshuva shouldn't work. The Medrash says they asked the Torah what should be the fate of someone who does tshuva. The Torah says, uh, try a carbon maybe. And they asked the Rebbein Shalaylam, what should be the fate of someone who does tshuva? God, uh, someone who does an Avera, God says let him do tshuva. So what do we learn from here? Tshuva cannot work logically. Navua doesn't recognize it. Wisdom doesn't recognize it. Logic doesn't recognize it. Even the Torah doesn't recognize it. The Torah does not recognize the process of Tshuva. Tshuva is a personal phenomenon between you and God. Only God recognizes Tshuva. Not Bezdin. Bezdin says, great, you did Tshuva. It's irrelevant. What does that have to do with the fact that we're about to kill you? Tshuva is a process only the Rebbe Hashem recognizes. Malachim certainly don't recognize it. Midas Hadin for sure doesn't recognize it. I would suggest the reason why Tshuva has to reach the Kisei HaKavod is because if it doesn't stand before the Kisei HaKavod, just in front of the Rebbe Hashem, without Malachi Asharis, there's no way for it to operate. So the Rebbe Hashem has to dig a special tunnel that nobody's looking at it, not Bezdin, not your mother-in-law, not the Malachi Asharis. Nobody's looking at your tshuva except for God. Nobody could see it. 
You know, the Vilna Gain and the Masi Rekeach have a, a mind-boggling observation on Sefer Devarim. Did you know that at the end of Sefer Devarim, not only is there a simon for how many psukim in Vizoy Sabracha, there's a simon for how many psukim in Sefer Devarim? It says there are 955 psukim in Sefer Devarim. One of the simonim is Hashamayim, Mem being um, Mem being 600. Right? You know that? A tough is 400, a final chaf is 500, final mem is 600, okay? Hashamayim. There are 955 psukim in Sefer Devarim. Ask the Vilna Gain, okay? You know, like, what are you going to do with that? What is the significance that there are 955 psukim in Sefer Devarim? Says the Vilna Gain in the name of the Megala Amukais, there are 955 levels in the heavens. There are 955 rokia. The first 900, a lot going on there. You have angels, you have Erelim, Mitsukim, Chayois. Apologize. You have Mitsukim, you have all kinds of heavenly angels. It's busy, there's traffic, there's all kinds of stuff going on in the heavens. You get to level 901 and there's nobody there. It's Enoid Movadai. There are no Malachim, there are no Srafim, there are no Aifanim, there are no Chayas HaKodesh. There's nobody but the Rishon. The simon is Hain Lashem Eloi Kecha Hashamayim Ushmei Hashamayim. Hain, 55, to God, the heavens and the upper heavens. You got that? The first 900 levels of heaven, busy. The last 55, it's just the Rebani Shalala. Says the Vilna Gain, Moshe Rabbeinu used the 955 Psukim of Devarim to be able to understand the 955 levels of heaven. You get to Pasuk 901. You ready for this? Fasten your seatbelts. Reu Ata! Ki ani ani hu ve'ein Elohim imodi machatsti v'ani erpa. It's me and it's only me. That's pasuk 901. Hafla v'fella. There are 955 psukim in Devarim. The first 900 correspond to the first 900 levels of heaven. The last 55 only. Corresponds to the psukim, corresponds to the levels of Shemaim that only the Rebbe Shalom is in. The 901st Pasuk is Ru Atasi now, Ki Ani Ani Hu, the Ain Elohim Imadi. No angels over here. So I always wondered what are these top 55 levels of heaven for? Like, it's only God. So what is it for? Like, what's, what's he doing there? I don't know if you could ask that question. You know how to ask what's Lamala, but... But the Pasuk says, Ru'u ata. How many times does the matter say, Ein ata ela tshuva? The word ayin, taf, hey, refers to tshuva. The top levels of the heaven, you know, the buffer zone before the Kisei HaKavayit, that's where the Rosh Hashem collects our tshuva. Because in the first 900 levels, <laughs> angels are not letting the tshuva go through. In fact, you know that Rizal writes that the clearest pasuk referring to tshuva in the Nevi'im is a pasuk in Yeshaya. Amar shoimer, asa boiker, im teboyun, if you want to do tshuva, boyu, do tshuva, frekta Rizal. Why are we all of a sudden writing about tshuva in Aramaic? because we don't want the angels to understand because they don't like tshuva. Tshuva is a personal phenomenon. Tshuva is a personal process. Tshuva is the rachamim of a father to a beloved child. There's no logic for tshuva. There's no logic for tshuva. 
You know, the Chida writes, how does tshuva work? It works midin av shemachal al kevoidoi, kevoidoi machal. That's why only Jews could do tshuva. You know that? Tshuva was only given to the Jewish people, it was not given to the Gentiles. You'll ask about Ninveh, the Ramah Mipano asks that, he gives four answers to it. But tshuva, fundamentally, is only given to the Jewish people. Because we're Hashem's children. <coughs> I could say this story because my son is not here. When I don't remember what age my son was. I said, Naftali, you know why I love you so much? He said, Daddy, why, why do you love me so much? I said, because I do. He said, uh, that doesn't make any sense. He said, right. That's tshuva. Tshuva is not a logical process. Tshuva is the love of our father for his beloved children. And nobody can accept this, and therefore the Rebbein Shalom has created a special tunnel which protects our tshuva and allows it entrance before the Kisei HaKavayit, possibly the last 55 levels of the Shemayim, Ru'u Ata, that nobody is there, so the Rebbein Shalom could accept it. Is it possible, can we say, that if in the end of days, we see that our enemies are so entrenched that their power comes from a labyrinth of secret underground tunnels where the government, they could knock off anyone anywhere, but they don't know what's going on in these tunnels. Is Rebbe Shalom saying, well, I would like the counter force from you. I would like the kayak kinegdom from you. I would like you to do something to be menagated. Is Rebbe Hashem telling us something? Is Rebbe Hashem saying, I am Roitzeb, is Shuvah? I would like you to make use of an opposing force? Do you have a network of tunnels? Do you have a labyrinth of tunnels? So you say, what am I talking about? I want to sh share with you a very interesting idea. You know, if you look in Sefer Archas Sadikim, we find not a list of mitzvahs, but a list of midos. And one of the midos that we find is tshuva. Is tshuva a mida? Kas is a mida. Kina is a mida. Gaiva is a mida. Nova is a mida. Is tshuva a mida? Tshuva is a mitzvah. I want to share with you something uh, that I've really been thinking about a lot lately. How often are you supposed to do tshuva? How often? Every year we have to do tshuva. Every year comes Yom Im Naram, we have to do tshuva. I won't let one year go by without doing tshuva on Yom Kippur. What does it say in Avis Reb Nasan? What does the Gemara say in Shabbos? Maran Shabbos says, Shuv Yom Echad Lefnei Misasach. So they asked her, Belezer, but, but a person doesn't know. He said, oh, right, exactly. So do tshuva every day. You know, if only we would know. Um, you know, they haven't created an app yet that will send you a notification one day before you go. You know, you get a beep one day before you go. Okay, do tshuva, and then, then you're good to go. They, ha they don't have that app yet. So you have to do tshuva every day. Why? Because you never know when you might go. Is that the only reason you have to do tshuva every day? You know, the Torah of Devira writes that tshuva is the sphere of bina. Yar geladam atzmai b'midas habina she'ein davar chashuv kamaya m'bnei shim sakenas hakoyal tzorech she'bechol yoyim v'yoyim yeharer b'tshuva k'day she'yia kol yomav b'tshuva Do you understand that a day is a living reality? A day is not, it's not like, okay, you live a certain amount of years. Every day is a living reality. When the day is over, it gets put in an escrow, it gets put in an account. You don't want a day to be put in an account unless the day has tshuva. You want the day to be injected with tshuva. The Ramban writes, b'shuva. <laughs> If you see a Talmud Chacham that didn't have at night, don't question him. The Mishnah Baruch says, Simon Reish Samatess, Belayla, Koydam Hashena, 
Yifashish v'masav. V'matzah v'ra. Yikabal atzma sholei l'asay sa'id. Okay, so you're supposed to do tshuva every day. The Rosh Chachma writes in Shar HaKadusha, Yisvada koidam sheyoichal v'yasa tshuva. Every time you eat, I, I, I hear that in Pesach, they eat a few times a day, right? At least a couple times a day. So the Rosh Hashanah said, before you eat, right? There's something called eating. You're familiar with that concept of eating. Before you eat, the Rosh Hashanah says, do tshuva. And say vidoy. The, the Shloss says, but on Shabbos you can't say vidoy. Okay, the Shloss says, so say, umal Hashem lekecha es lavavcha ve'es lavav zarecha. Okay, so I'm doing tshuva every night. I'm doing tshuva every day. I'm doing tshuva before I eat. You know, Ramosha Cordovero writes in the Paradise Remind Him that there are different units of time in life and you want to make sure that when the unit of time passes, it doesn't get put away before you do tshuva. Therefore, shkia, right before shkia, you should try to do tshuva before the day is over. And then Friday afternoon before Shabbos, before the week is over, you should try to do tshuva. Oh, and that's pshad in, in Yom Kippur Katan. It's not a, you don't, whether you say the half hour till you don't say the half hour, the nakuda is before the month is over and be put in the safe deposit box, you want to think, you know what? I did things this, this month I could have improved on. I'm a mischaret, I'm a mizvade, I'm a kabbal on myself to be better next month. You want the year, you want the month, before it gets put away, it should have tshuva in it. Now we know why Arab Rosh Hashanah is so important. Before the year gets put away, you want to do tshuva. Say, that's a lot of tshuva. Says the Chida, you know, the Chida wrote a sefer, Moira Be'etzba. The very first halach in the Moira Be'etzba. Kaidam kalimud va'asiyas hamitzva yaharher betshuva. Before every time you learn, before every mitzvah you do, you should think about tshuva. So then, what? What I'm doing tshuva all day? Tshuva is not just a mitzvah; it's a mindset. It's a mida in your Rav's beautiful sefer. I believe it brings from the Mabit that the definition of tshuva is. Kirva el Elohim me'richa kachet. Tshuva is a mindset of coming closer to the Yibbam after being distant from sin. So that's a certain mida, like anava. It's a mida. Tshuva is a mida. It's a mindset. I'm returning to Hashem. When I eat, okay, let me pause. It's an opportunity for me to return to Hashem. When I go to sleep, it's an opportunity for me to return to Hashem. When the day is about to end, it's an opportunity for me to return to Hashem. Someone who lives that way probably will never need to think, oh, did I do tshuva today? Eating. Mitzvahs. You know, there's something called mitzvahs. <laughs> so that means before tzitzis, before tefillin, before berchas ha before kriya shema, before limad ha before a chesed. The idea is when I do the mitzvah, I want to do the mitzvah in the best possible state. I want to do it in my best light, in my best form. So I'm going to have a thought of tshuva. By the way, just a little tidbit. You know, the Gemara says in Masech Shabbos that anyone who says Vayichulu Friday night, the two Malachi Asharis come and they put their hand on your head and they say, your sins are forgiven. So Rav Miller said, wow, that's even better than Yom Kippur, because Yom Kippur does nothing if you don't do tshuva. And here, Vayichulu alone wipes away all your sins. So Rav Miller would say, of course, Vayichulu only works if you're Mahar Her B'tshuva. So this Friday night, it's a biggie. You know, that's a, that's a good skula. Vayichulu on a Yom Kippur? That means you did pretty well, just like in the opening moments of Yom Kippur. You already got off to a good start. Tshuva is a mindset. So do you have a labyrinth of tunnels in your repertoire? It's a very large network you could make, you could build. It's not just like a one, one little tunnel you make once a year. Your entire year is networked in the mida of tshuva. You're living in tshuva.
You know, there's a philosophical question. A Jew who was killed, but maybe didn't even know what it meant to be a Jew, didn't have an awareness, didn't have an appreciation, are they automatically holy? If they would have had the opportunity to renounce the religion, would they have done so to save their life? Would they still be a Kaddish? It's a question. Did you know Rabbi Shlomo Zalman writes, there's no free pass that just because somebody is killed because they're Jewish, they're automatically a Kaddish? It's a, popu it's a popular thing to say. So we'll go with it. But Rabbi Shlomo Zalman says, it's not, it's not really true. It's not accurate. The Nesiva Shalom writes likewise. He says, you want to know if a Jew who was murdered is a Kaddish? You know who it's up to? It's not up to them. It's up to you. There's a Toysus in Chulan that the Rebbe Reb Zusha was learning and the Baal Toysus came to the Rebbe Reb Zusha. Toysus says like this, the Gemara says in Chulan, Yisrael Kedoshim Heim, Jews are holy. Some Jews give tzedakah and they don't want to. Some Jews want to and they don't give. So the Jews that want to and they don't give, we understand they want to, they wish they had money, but they, they don't have money, so they can't give. But why are Jews who give holy if they didn't want to do it and they just did it because somebody pressured them into doing it? So the Rebbe of Zusha didn't understand what Toysus meant. And Toysus came to the Rebbe of Zusha and Toysus said, there's a klal, Yisrael Kedoshim Heim. The entity of the Jewish people are holy. So the act of empty tzedakah performed by a Jew who didn't want to give tzedakah will join with the kavana toiva of another Jew who wanted to give tzedakah, fuse together, and become a beautiful act of tzedakah, says the Nesiva Shalem in the Holocaust. And I remember this was applicable to other times, the Pittsburgh Massacre, whether somebody died as a martyr is dependent on the kavanais of Shalomei and Muna Yisrael. Do you know that there's a very important kavana to have when you say Shema? You know the Shulchan Aruch writes that when you say Shema, you should say Shema be'ima uveyira uveresas uvezea with fear, with awe, with trepidation, with sweat, with, with trembling. Why do you need to get so worked up when you say Shema? Because there's an idea when you say Shema, you have in mind that if you'd ever be put to the ultimate challenge, you'd give up your life, al Kedosh Hashem. That's one of the important kavanas of Shema. So the Nesiva Shalom writes, you want to commemorate the lives of Jews who were killed just because they were Jews? If you're mechavin, when you say Shema, that if ever put to the ultimate challenge, you'd give up your life, al Kedosh Hashem, the kavana of Shloimei Amune Yisrael could join up with the Kiddush Hashem of Jews who maybe never had that opportunity to appreciate and together it becomes a beautiful act of Kiddush Hashem. So the state and the status of what happened a year ago is pending. Through our mitzvahs and masen tovim, and primarily our kavanos, it could add, if we could say such a thing, to what happened. Just to end with a new kind of tshuva. The Ramchal wrote a sefer of tefillos. And in Tefillah Kufnun Ches, the Ramchal reveals a new kind of tshuva. He says, Rebani Shalaylam, V'im toimar she'ein Yisrael oisim tshuva lefanecha. God Almighty, even if the Jewish people don't do a proper tshuva, Harei kivoy shalohem l'geula yamoid b'makam tshuva. Please accept the yearning of the Jewish people for the redemption in lieu of tshuva. It's a very interesting concept, interesting idea. Chassam Seifer also writes, that in the end of days, the being mitzapel Yeshua of Kal Yisrael, 
Hashem could reckon as a tshuva gemurah. As we mentioned, tshuva is coming close to Hashem, meiricho kachet. So if there's anything that October 7th has done for Klal Yisrael, I think it has made a little bit more real our tzipoy Yeshua, our tefillah of Yerushalayim Mercha, our tefillah of Asamach David, our tefillah of Asachazena Ineinu. And if when we yearn for the Gula, we think, you know, Rebbe Nishalayim, a lot of things I'm working on. But I would like to come closer to you, Meiricha Kachet, and I would like to do that with the coming of the Gula. That's also what Rabbi Yisrael Salanter would say, perhaps, Begeder Oisa Tshuva. So these are a few humble thoughts regarding this historic date, October 7th, which is my anniversary, but it's also the anniversary of uh, that day that shall live in infamy. And as is Hashem, may Hashem accept our efforts of tshuva and our efforts with Hashem Shemayim, that it should be the end of Tsaris for Klal Yisrael, and from here on we should only see Yeshuais Fenachamais, Besurais Toivais, Shuobi Zoicha, to a Gmarchasima Toiva, and a good Kabenchjar. Thank you very much.